Thank you. Have you ever gone to look in front of the mirror, convinced that today I look good? When you put on that skirt, you notice just how well it fits you. When you did up that last button on your shirt, you were convinced that I look sharp today. And then you walk over to the mirror and realize that, in fact, the way this ensemble looked in my head is not how it looks. And then comes the disappointment, the reevaluation, the okay, let me wear something else. I have learned that traveling is kind of like that mirror. You start off sure of yourself, certain that you can handle whatever comes your way, convinced that you can shine, and maybe even thrive in new environments. And then comes the reality. With your comfort zone gone, you have to readjust and reformat yourself, in a sense, to your new surroundings. In the process, you're forced to take stock of who you thought you were, what you believe, and what you're willing to compromise. In 2012, I was awarded a Thomas J. Watson Fellowship to study the motivation for youth political activism in Egypt, Tunisia, Ghana, the Czech Republic, and Cambodia. That experience really stretched my perspectives, and it pushed me to ask the hard questions of the world and of myself. That process showed me just how much experience can change a person, and just how much it, it changed me. And not necessarily in the I became wiser or more knowledgeable kind of way, um, but at a more basic level, it pushed me to ask myself, am I as special as I think I am? Today I want to share part of that journey of self, or at least the part that I now understand with you. I carried this mustard notebook with me almost everywhere. And I carried it because it was always familiar. It had my thoughts scribbled across its pages. It had my musings documented within it. Parents lived in communism, it reads. They struggled to explain democracy to their children. And I wrote this while interviewing a young man in the Czech Republic who believed that youth engagement began at an early age. And the exclamation marks next to his comments show that I agreed. His work reflected how the Czech Republic, although relatively new to democratic institutions, was not unfamiliar with democratic ideals. And this notion was reiterated to me over and over again as I met advocates teaching teachers so that when they taught, the very essence of engagement, agency, and voice was embedded in every student's education. This was the government's responsibility, another young man told me, to instill the ideals of freedom and democracy to its people. But what if the government doesn't want democracy? <laughs> what if it's not about the people at all? See, throughout my fellowship year, the more conversations I had, the more questions I had, and the more this notebook was filled with existential ramblings, wondering why, and systems everyone agreed were inadequate, bordering on defunct, young people were still advocating for change. Did young people really have a voice in the national political space? Or were their votes the only thing that politicians really heard? And who are these young people anyway? I asked a few pages earlier. After a young Bedouin woman in Hamata, Egypt, told me, we had no idea what people were protesting about in Cairo. Her words shocked me. She described her experience, or lack thereof, with the revolution, couched in the sandy white desert corners of Egypt, living on the edge of the piercing blue Red Sea. It was clear that her peace hadn't been disturbed by the up uprising in the capital. And it was clearer still that nobody had really made an effort to communicate the ideals of the revolution to the furthest reaches of the country. And it was clearest that when liberals in Cairo blamed the uneducated for electing the Muslim Brotherhood into power, in part, they were referring to people like this woman, who hadn't been a part of the revolution and thus could not identify with it. Across the pages of my notebook, I'm left wondering if people do not know what you're fighting for, how can they fight with you? Will they ever feel as though your struggle is real? And how does one even convince people of this struggle 
is a question I ask a few pages later. I wrote this while sitting in an auditorium for a groundbreaking youth conference in Accra, Ghana, after a young woman got up to say something along the lines of, women need to be less frivolous, more proactive, more vocal in politics. Her comment struck a chord with the majority of mostly men in the section where I was seated, and their contribution to the newly opened debate was, women need to be educated. They cannot be voted for just because they were women. So in essence, it was vocalized that women had to earn their place at the table, just like the men had. Except, in my experience, the men hadn't really earned their place at the table. They had been ushered there, groomed to be leaders by a system of patronage politics that was more accustomed to, and perhaps even more comfortable with seeing male instead of female leaders. In that auditorium, I had the realization that the glass ceiling is real for many women across the world. And I now wondered what it would take to break it, given that the holders of power were so oblivious to the existence of the ceiling on which their feet rested. There hasn't been much resolution to the questions I began asking during my fellowship year. And I realized maybe a little bit late that these questions weren't really meant to be answered. They were meant to open up my imagination of what the world was and what it could be. What I didn't realize at the time, however, is that these experiences also raised questions about who I thought I was and who I thought I could be. I had set out in search of the motivation for youth political activism, but the question I was really asking was, do I have what it takes to be politically active? Do I have what it takes to make a change? Now, if you know anything about Zimbabwe, you know that that is a heavy question to ask of anyone. I live in a country where fatigue has turned to apathy, political reform is out of the question, and people come up with ways to circumvent whatever socioeconomic obstacles that present themselves in our society. We don't make a change, we make a plan and figure out a way to get around the problems instead of dealing with them. And though there are people who are trying and have tried to be voices of reason in an irrational political climate, their moderate success and continued struggle give a cautionary tale to all who would try and engage with the system. And yet, I thought, somewhat foolishly, that after a year of learning with and talking to and experiencing political activism, I would somehow go home and become a beret-wearing, constitution-wielding activist and figure out a new way to transform my country. Really, what I learned about myself that year is the following. First, I am a woman, and there can be limitations that come with that. While sitting in that auditorium in Accra, I felt enraged, and I still do to some extent. People have yet to understand the lived reality of a woman, and now women are pressed against the wall to prove their oppression. But that experience has made me more mindful of the gendered nature of our everyday discussions and my role in bringing that up in whatever space I find myself to make sure that it's not forgotten or swept under the rug. Second, <sighs> making more noise does not mean people can hear you. Now, this is still a lesson in progress for me, but I realize that much like the revolutionaries in Cairo, when you're so convinced of your struggle, you forget to ask people if they care too, or why they feel the way they do. Differing opinions are not only the growing tools for democracy, they're the very essence of developing critical thought. And if we always argued with people we agreed with, what would be the point? Third, I still have a long way to grow. In 2012, when I graduated, Grinnell was my world, and I was somebody here. And then, I entered a world where nobody knew my name. And while there can be comfort in that anonymity, you quickly learn that all people know of you is what they see now. And so you have to prove yourself over and over again in order to gain respect. And thus, it is imperative that we constantly push ourselves to be better, refusing for college to be our personal peak, and striving every day to hold ourselves to the high standards to which we want to hold the society around us. Now, I applied for the Watson Fellowship, but I didn't really apply for the upheaval of self and personal evolution in the process. 
That was the unstated part of the package. But now, no matter how challenging that experience was, I, I wouldn't take it back. The comments, quotes, and questions in my notebook remind me every day that this has been my most enriching learning experience to date. And so today, I want to challenge you to push yourself to be better, no matter how daunting that may seem. Ask the hard questions of your peers and of yourself. And don't be afraid of immersing yourself in places in which you know nothing about, because therein you might lose or maybe even find yourself. Don't be afraid to do those very things that scare you and look into that mirror and see yourself. As long as you keep an open mind, you'll be all the better for it. I realize now that the Watson experience was only the beginning of my self-discovery through, ex through experience and experiencing the world. Will I become a political activist? Right now, there's no saying. But what I do know is that experience has taught me to be present in everything I do, active and advocating for those in need, and dedicated to making this world more democratic, at least socially, if not yet politically. Thank you.